What's up team? Today we're going to talk about using a joiner. How to use it, what are the differences between some that you'll see online, the expensive ones, the portable ones, the floor stand ones, all that good stuff. And then we're going to go through the process of jointing, face jointing and edge jointing a board using our joiner and our planer. That's another thing we'll talk about are the differences between a planer and a joiner. And I think that's all I have for the intro of this video. We'll also talk about these steps you need to take to uh, align your joiner and set it up properly to ensure the first time you use it is perfect, right? The way that you set it up will allow you for accurate and complete joinery, uh, jointing without uh, making the common mistakes that I did. So making this longer than it needs to be, let's get into it. Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is what is joining. I'm saying joining uh, as if I'm using joinery, but in this case, I'm talking about jointing a board. So what is joining and why do we do it? Why do we use it? Uh, joining makes a board perfectly flat. Now, that's a common misconception between what a joiner does and what a planer does. A joiner makes a surface perfectly flat where a planer makes a surface perfectly parallel to another. So a planer helps you to achieve a consistent and constant thickness throughout a piece of stock, whereas a joiner helps you achieve, achieve that per perfect flatness. So what do I mean when I say perfect flatness? Let me grab my square. So we've got this piece of lumber, and you'll see that obviously it's got four sides here, and this is rough sawn lumber. And so it hasn't been surfaced in any way, shape, or form except for this one edge, which was cut with a table saw. So I know that that's a straight edge. But as for these other edges and faces and ends, they are not perfectly flat. So how we see that, and I'll hold it up to you here. When I, when I rest this uh, flat edge, I'm going to bring it to you, perfectly against uh, this board, you'll see that there is still a gap, right? You can see it right where the edge of that metal ruler meets the face. And the same thing goes, you know, that's my straight edge, don't want to do that, for this side, and that's actually not too bad. This is not a bad piece of stock. But anyways, we want to surface this lumber so it's completely flat on this side. We'll plane it to get it completely parallel with the flat surface, and then we will uh, edge join, so get an edge completely flat, uh, and then we will use a table saw to get the other side parallel, and that will give us a square piece of stock, right? So perfectly square on all four sides. So why we use a joiner for that? Let's get familiar with some of the pieces of our joiner here. So this is a portable benchtop planer. I'm sorry, portable benchtop joiner. And we've got a couple components here. So we have our in-feed table, our out-feed table, and our fence along with the cutter head and then the guard, right? So those are kind of our four main components of a joiner. Um, and what that joiner is doing is as I'm sliding a face along the in-feed and out-feed table or an edge along that table in reference to the fence, boy, my neighbor's weed eater is super loud, um, it is cutting away at that board to keep it, uh, to make it flat. And so let me get a little diagram here, a demonstration to show you exactly what that looks like. Okay, so here we have a super blown up view of what the infeed, the outfeed, and the cutter head are doing in reference to a piece of stock that we pass through the joiner. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that the infeed table is not aligned with the outfeed table. And that uh, is surprising, but that's how a joiner works, right? The infeed table is raised or lowered to set a cut depth for the cutter head in reference to the outfeed table. So as your piece of stock is coming along from the in-feed table to the out-feed table, it's taking, let's say in this case, it's an eighth of an inch, since this is super blown up, an eighth of an inch off in order to uh, cut away at that wood. And, and why that's important, we'll talk about here in a few minutes when we talk about the different types of uh, warps in your stock that you may want to use a joiner to get rid of. So that's basically how it's working, right? The cutter head is turning in a clockwise direction and it's taking wood away as it passes through. So that's how our joiner works. Going back to our in-feed, out-feed table <clears throat> fence, cutter head, and, and guard, let's talk a little bit about joiners. 
So this is a portable bench top joiner that you can see. This is a six inch joiner made by Wynn. It's got a spiral cutter head. And this is the one I chose. And I went back and forth between the six inch and the eight inch Wynn, but I knew that I needed a portable joiner because I have a limited amount of space and I didn't necessarily have enough space to have a four freestanding joiner. Now there's differences between all those, the six, the six inch, the eight inch, the portable versus the, the standing. And, and that's what I want to explain to you. That's really what I want to get across uh, as one of the things in this video. So a six inch versus an eight inch. Let's, nope, let's start with a portable versus a freestanding. Uh, nope, let's go back to six inch versus eight, eight inch because it, it ties into all this, I promise. So I was going between the six inch or the eight inch. And what that's referencing is the width of the in feed and out feed table, right? So six inches from the edge of the cutter table, uh, the out feed table to the um, front edge. So I have six inches I can uh, successfully joint and a six inch wide board. Now with the eight inch, obviously I can do an eight inch board and, and so on. You'll go up to 10 to some even 12 inch. Now those are not portable. The 10 and the 12 inch would definitely be a freestanding joiner. Now I thought that that really mattered, but in fact it doesn't, okay? Um, if you have to join something that's wider than six inches uh, for a panel glue up, something like that, especially if it's for a panel glue up, you can just do the math and cut it down to five inches and then go from there. For instance, the tabletop for my dresser that I'm building needed to be 20 inches wide. So I did four five inch panels instead of doing, I don't know, that's not divisible by six necessarily, um, but let's say I had a 10 inch joiner instead of doing two 10 inch pieces, I did five or four five inch pieces. So you can always work around the width limitations of your joiner, okay? And there are all kinds of videos to show you how to do that uh, as well. What's really important is the length of your in feed and your out feed table combined. And that's where we get into the perks between a freestanding and a portable bench top planer. Now the portable bench top planers are all gonna have much shorter in feed out feed table combined lengths and the general rule of thumb is that you should never join something that's greater than two times the length of your in feed table okay so for me that would probably be a maybe doing a four foot board that's about my max and it really i agree that is my max um so that's the differences between the portable and the freestanding uh, tables, and that's what you will definitely want to consider as well as the price tag, right? Now, there are ways to get away around the in-feed, out-feed table length limitation. You can do what I did, which is to build it into the table here, and that works so long as your table is completely flat and level. Mine is not, but it works well enough for this purpose, so I just caution you into that when you're doing that to really pay attention to that to do uh, the best job you can to get a, a flat surface. Now let's talk about the different types of cutter heads, right? We've, it's pretty standard when you're looking at cutter heads when you talk about uh, a planer, right? You have your blade um, cutter head, which is typically one long blade that's, you know, across the entirety of the cutter head, and there's maybe three of them, and they rotate at uh, that constant RPM. Uh, and then you've got your spiral, which is what I have, and so that's smaller blades along the length of the blade um, offset with every kind of rotation. Um, so that, uh, and, the, and the perks to that is that you can replace those smaller blades at a much smaller cost if you nick one of the blades as opposed to having to replace an entire uh, blade that's the width of your cutter head. Now you have your helical cutter heads and those are the nicest to make the cleanest cuts and uh, do it kind of the, the most efficiently, but those are very expensive. And a lot of joiners, you can upgrade the existing cutter head to a helical, look at bird pools or something like that. So that's my piece on cutter heads. All right, in feed, out feed table, fence, and uh, edge guard or uh, fence. Nope, I literally cannot think of the word right now. Either way, we don't need to talk about this. We need to talk about these three things. All right, let's talk about setting up your joiner right out of the box so you can avoid these mistakes that I made that will really save you a lot of time joining. So, the things that are important here right out of the box making sure that your out feed table is co planar to your in feed table. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and set mine back to co-planer, bring it all the way up to zero, and then I'm going to reorient the camera. Be right back. Okay, so you just got your brand new joiner right out of the box. This is what I want you to do. If you're not getting consistent cuts with your joiner, you're noticing that it's not cutting the way it should be, this is what I want you to do. 
take a straight edge. I'm using a level in this instance, but a nice long steel ruler will work as well. And make sure that you've got pretty good coverage over the entirety of your infeed and your outfeed table. I want you to place almost exactly dead center the edge of that um, flat surface. Um, and then you're going to look to make sure that there is no light shining through or that it is dead level between the infeed and the outfeed table. That's how you check for coplanar. A really easy way to do this, especially if you're using a level, is to push on one end and make sure there's no rocking, right? If my infeed table was lower, then you would get a rocking uh, mechanism. So that obviously is super important. So coplanarity, you want to check for that right out of the box, okay? Every planer is going to be a little bit different. I'm sorry, I keep saying planer. Every joiner is going to be a little bit different when you go to adjust your infeed and outfeed table for coplanarity. My way on the wind, keep your instruction manual, always keep those so that you can reference them when you need to make adjustments to your tools. You take out this uh, screw right here for the outfeed table and there's a set screw underneath that that allows you to make micro adjustments to raise or lower your outfeed table. And I had to do that in order to get my, my tables here coplanar. So that's the first thing you need to check. The second thing you need to check is to make sure that your blades are either parallel or slightly higher than your outfeed table. So one more time here, I'm gonna reorient the camera because I know you can't see this. see this. Okay, so you won't be able to see me talking here, but that's totally fine. So what I mean when I say uh, parallel to your outfeed table is that the top of the blade at the peak of its rotation is exactly level with your outfeed table. Now that's almost impossible to do, right? Unless you have super special calibration tools in your shop to do this. So I'm gonna show you a trick to get it done. But if it's not, if this cutter head is lower than your outfeed table, you'll either meet resistance as you push a piece of stock through, or you just won't get uh, the cut that you're looking for as you're taking through stock. You'll get like snipe um, and things like that, right? Uh, or it's just not gonna be a consistent cut. So let me show you how to adjust that and how to set it. Okay, so go ahead and get a straight edge. You can use a square like me. Um, just get a, a straight edge and then rotate the blades so that they're slightly uh, just behind the outfeed table here, meaning when you rotate it in that clockwise fashion, the blade will come and be exposed to the peak of its rotation. If you've got the cutter head that's got the blade all the way across, just line that up. If you've got the spiral, make sure that the blade is actually going to come up and make contact with your straight edge. Okay. Whenever you're manipulating the cutter head, always use something to put your to get down in there, not your finger, because you could cut yourself. Don't ask me how I know. All right, as I do this, really pay attention right here to the straight edge, right? So I'm going to rotate it around so my blades are coming around. Just see that? I'll knock it back just so you can see. Doing it one more time. There you go. You see that my straight edge moves forward about an eighth to a sixteenth of an inch, right? An eighth is probably a little much. A sixteenth is just right. Anywhere in that 1 to 32nd to 1 to 16th uh, range. So what that's telling me is that my cutter head is just, just, just slightly above my outfeed table, which is fine, right? That's close enough to parallel that it'll work. So that's kind of the trick. And again, your specific joiner will have instructions on how to raise or lower that cutter head. So check those two things, right? Coplanarity and then adjusting your cutter head. Final thing, and this really only applies to edge joining. So let's go there now. All right, you want to make sure that your fence is completely square to the infeed and outfeed tables, right? So almost every time before you go to edge join, definitely break out your square and check that squareness, right, on both sides, because the only thing making that edge square to the face is the squareness between the um, surface that you're referencing, in this case being the fence and the infeed table. Um, I think that's all I had on that and that, uh, and there was something else I just remembered. So let me think about that one. Okay. That's right. So why it's important to have that square, right? And the same reason it's important to have a pretty unblemished in feed out feed table or for that coplanet planarity, funny word, if it even is a word to exist, right? When you are face joining, so the face joint means to make the face of a piece of stock completely flat. Um, when you are face joining, you're referencing the infeed to the outfeed table. Okay, so that's why it has to be perfectly flat. When you're edge joining, you're referencing the square.
between the fence and the in-feed, out-feed table, right? That's why you push it up against the fence when you edge join. So that's why uh, that square is, is important because of what you're referencing. Okay, so what is joining helping us to accomplish? So you can pretty much have three defects in your piece of stock before you go to join it. And the reason you're getting that flat surface is to get rid of these three issues, right? You can either have a crown, a cup, or a twist, or anything there between. So what, I'm sorry, not a crown, a bow, a cup, or a twist. So what a bow is, right, if we're looking at this piece of stock, this is the long piece, right, um, or the length of the piece. The front of the piece is going to be the same level as the back of the piece, but in the middle, there's going to be a gap. And that's actually what we're going to join today, so you'll be able to see that real time. But what that's going to give you is this crown, right? It's going to look like an arch to the piece of wood. Now, when you go to join something with a bow, you always want the crown to be facing up. So when you lay it on its uh, flat surface, you want to make sure that there is two flat ends at the front and the uh, end of the piece to reference the table, and that gap will be in the middle of the piece. If you were to flip this over, and I'll show you that when we join it today, you'll notice that the middle of the piece is making contact with the surface, but the front and the ends are not, and it allows it to rock, so it would be like this, rock on the table. That's how you know you have your crown. That's a bow. Now, a cup, if you're looking at the end of the piece, right, this is the end grain, there will be a uh, arch to the center of the board. Now, that's not too bad. It's pretty, pretty easy to join out. And finally, a twist is not something I can draw. But if you lay your piece of wood uh, lengthwise on a flat surface against the flat surface of your piece of stock, and then you press the front left corner down, it would raise up the back right corner, right? And so that's rocking from side to side of the piece. So you've got a twist in your wood, and I'll show you how to joint that out as well. So those are kind of the three defects you find when you buy lumber, whether it's from a big box store or from a lumber mill, and why you would want to use a joiner to get this surface completely flat. Okay, so as discussed, this is the piece of wood that we're going to be jointing today. So there is a bow in this piece of wood. And you can see it if you can look real closely. I know this is almost a flat board, so it's kind of hard to see, but there is a gap between the front and the back of this board. And so if I flip it around, the two ends, you can really see it here, are no longer making contact with the table and it rocks, right? So then I know that my crown right now is facing down and it's upside down. So I'm going to join it with the crown facing up. The other thing you need to know when you're joining a board is how to pass it through, right? And it all depends on the grain direction of your piece. So this is really hard to tell. Let me go ahead and flip it around so we can see the uh, cut piece with the uh, table saw because it's a lot easier to see at that point. So you want the grain to be running uh, from the top to the bottom along the feed direction, right? So I've drawn an image to help us see this because it's actually really hard on a piece of wood over video. Okay, I think you can see it there if I hold it here. Okay, so here's my example piece of wood, right? And I've got my grain direction starting from the top here and it slowly works itself down in those curves. So you can see that as you push it from right to left over the cutter head, the cutter head is cutting with the grain. So you need to pay attention to that when you're using your joiner. That's how you avoid snipe and get the cleanest cuts with the least amount of resistance. Super important. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about before we get to joining, besides cut depth, so the second last thing, I guess, really, is how to use paddles, right? Because you have to use paddles in order to keep yourself safe when using this machine, but you wanna use them correctly so that you get the correct cut on your piece of wood, right? Doing it incorrectly can lead to not actually surfacing or flattening the surface, but really just treating it like a planer because planers use pressure rollers, which your paddles can be turned into. So likely that your joiner came with two paddles. You can either use these two paddles or upgrade. And I'll tell you why you might want to upgrade. So using my little diagram here, as you're pushing, let's set it here and hopefully you can still see it. As you're pushing your piece of stock through the uh, joiner, right? In feed table here, out feed table, feed direction going this way. You'll want your paddles on the front end and the back end of the board. And that's very important, right? And you want to apply a very small amount of pressure, and let me show you why. So there are only two forces acting on this board as you push it through the planer. That first force is the actual friction 
between the cast iron surface, if you have a cast iron surface, and the bottom of the, the piece, right? There may be a little friction, so you're trying to counteract that friction to keep it moving forward, right? The second type of force acting on the piece of stock is going to be the force from the cutter head lifting up on the piece. Now, it's not much. It's a little bit, but what you want to avoid is putting pressure right on the center, especially if you've got something like a bow, putting force, honestly, anywhere against this piece too much to where you're flattening it out, right? Because that's how a planer works. It flattens a piece to achieve that constant thickness. So if you're really putting pressure down in here as you move it through, you're going to flatten this piece down as it goes through the joiner, and as it comes back out the other side and you relieve that pressure, it's just going to spring back up into that same bowed, cupped, or twisted position. So you're applying minimal pressure in the right areas to counteract those two forces acting on the piece of stock. Now, why I said you might want to upgrade your, your paddles, right? So these work well, but they can slip off and they can kind of force you to put some downward pressure as you're counteracting that friction against the infeed direction. So what you might want to invest in, you might already have one for your table saw if you have one, but I recommend getting a push block with a hook on the back. That way you can apply that friction, that uh, force in the same direction as the friction acting on it. Instead of trying to press the force down and out, all you're doing is pressing it out. So that's my piece of advice and that's how I do it. And that's the second to last thing I talk about. We'll talk about cutter depth and we'll get right into joining. Okay, so we've determined which side of our board we're going to surface. We're going to do a face first. We've decided that the edge grain is going in the correct direction, and I think I almost actually put it in the, the wrong direction, so I'll flip that around. Um, and now we're ready to use our joiner. We've got everything coplanar. We've got everything square. We're ready to use it. So how do we set the cut depth, right? And if you'll remember from all my diagrams, the outfeed table was always higher than the infeed table, and that's how a joiner works. So how do you set that, right? Every joiner will have a cut depth indicator on the front of the joiner, much like this one, but it may be a different mechanism to adjust it. So for me, I'm going to loosen this guy here, and then you'll see I go from zero to an eighth of an inch. Now, this is not a very high horsepower uh, piece of equipment, and it's not the like nicest cutter head. So I don't want to tax it too much on each pass. So I only take off at max up to a 32nd of an inch at one time. That also allows you to correct any mistakes before it really damages your piece of stock, okay? So I've set my cutter head, we're ready to get through with joining. Okay, and I'll just talk about one last thing, not really the last thing, but before we start joining, you kinda wanna make sure that you are getting a flat piece, right? Now you can always reference a surface to do that if you've got a completely flat surface the size of your piece, or you can do what you would typically do with sanding, um, you can kind of scribble a line along the face or the edge that you're joining. And when that whole scribble is gone, you know that you've surfaced the entire piece and it's flat from end to end. Now, if you've got rough sawn lumber like this, you can just pass it straight through. And you'll see why I'll show you after the first pass that there will still some, be some of the rough spawn spots, likely in the middle of the board where the crown or the bow is. And that's how you know that uh, you're surfacing it by flattening it. You're taking off just enough until you get to that high spot once it's all flat and it's all uh, rough sawn is gone. Okay, so you can see we've got a completely flat surface along the bottom piece here, but what we don't have is a consistent thickness throughout the right we just took a little bit off of each end that was flat to the table, but we still got this crown in the middle. So we're going to be slightly thicker in the middle of the piece than we are on the front. And so to properly um, be able to face joint this to another piece, we have to get that uniform thickness and surface this face as well. Now, why you can't just do that with a uh, joiner, it'll make it flat, yes, but it won't achieve that constant uh, the consistent thickness because it doesn't have those pressure rollers that your planer does to achieve that consistent thickness. So you always want to join with the jointed sign down first, right? Because the planer is using those pressure rollers to reference this face, this completely flat face against the um, top of the piece, right? So let's go ahead and get a tape measure out and see what our thickness is currently. 
So we're going to measure this piece in three areas. So the first one here, we are at, see, just over seven eighths of an inch. We'll go to the middle of the piece. That's at just under an inch. And the end of the piece, similar to the edge, the back edge, we're at just over seven eighths. So uh, that was pretty close. It's pretty consistent because this piece didn't have a large bow to it, but we still want it to be that constant thickness. I'm going to get it down to about a half inch here with my planer. So I've got a completely square board. Now, it's interesting to note that I'm planing before I edge joint. And there's a reason for that, right? I told you already that uh, you always want to join something with the bow to the ground, so the crown up, right? So if I look at my piece here, set it on this nice flat edge. My bow, it's not much of one, the bow could be here, right? So I want crown up, bow down, but my fence that I'd have to reference it to is not being paired with a completely flat face, right? And so if you plane in between face joining, it gives you more options to joint either edge of your piece as opposed to only being able to join edge join the side in reference to your flat surface. So I say always plane in between. Let's go ahead and plane this down. Okay, so once we're done and through with planing it, we'll just go ahead and check that thickness. Right at three-fourths exactly on all lengths of this board. And when I lay it against my flat surface, it's completely flat at that consistent thickness. So now this has been face joined and planed. Let's get to edge joining. Okay, so just like I told you guys to do at the beginning of the video, I'm going to do and follow my own advice. And it looks like my table may, nope, perfect, right in the square there, square here. You just never know when this thing will come out of square, especially if you've got a cheaper table like I do myself, and uh, you just want to double check. Now, I've got a rough sawn edge and like I said, a straight edge that I cut from my table saw, so I'm going to go ahead and use the rough sawn edge, and that's what we're going to uh, edge joint. Now, like I said earlier in what I was trying to explain, right, if I wanted to join this edge, but I hadn't surfaced both sides, I would be limited to the jointed side, even if the bow was in this direction, right? But you always want it to be in this direction. So it just gives you some flexibility. So to edge joint this, you're going to place it up against the fence. You're going to apply pressure towards the fence and then on the back of the piece again, sliding it through. So let's do what that looks like. Okay, and that's it, folks. That's how you properly edge joint and face joint a board. Um, so we've got two completely flat uh, faces be the planer and the joiner, and then a flat edge um, from the table saw and the joiner itself. My goodness. Uh, I will say this about using a table saw to get a straight edge. If you're going to do an edge glue up, right, you're going to glue two edges of a board together, I would always use a joiner because it's going to do a better job than a table saw if your table saw is not at a perfect 90. And again, without those calibration tools, hard to get it at that perfect 90. So let's check for square here so that you believe what I'm selling you. Rest that against, completely square there. Rotate it up to the other side, completely square there. And then from end to face, completely square and same 
for this side here. Okay, well guys, that's it. That's how you use a joiner, kind of like my joiner 101, right? We went through the different types of joiners, which you may want to look for and consider when buying the length of your joiner versus the width, what type of cutter head you have or you'll get. Um, and then we talked about how to properly align your joiner, right? Looking for that coplanarity, uh, the square of the fence to the table, the uh, cutter head alignment to the outfeed table being either parallel or slightly above, right? And once that's all set up, you're ready to join or surface your first piece of stock. And I taught you how to look at the end grain to know which direction to feed the piece in and then the types of um, defects in your stock that you could uh, run into and how to get them out, right? So if you have any questions at all, please let me know in the comments. I've learned a lot about joining in the past month as I've been milling a lot of lumber down kind of for the first time and have run into a lot of issues, mainly stemming from failing to align my table out of the box. So again, do yourself a favor and just spend the 15 or 20 minutes doing that right out of the box. Um, and that's pretty much all I have for you guys today. Uh, let me know again in the comments, any questions, I'll link everything that I use here today in the description. There are affiliate links. It helps support the channel. So uh, yeah, like, subscribe for more content. It's been five o'clock woodshop.